Hey everybody, my name is Luke Allen. I want to thank you for joining me for another iOS tutorial. Now before I get started, I want to point out that this video is brought to you by Comet Chat. Like the name implies, Comet Chat is a chat software solution. It can be video, voice, or text. And of course they support iOS. It's free to try. Link is in the bio. I highly recommend you check it out, cometchat.com. Today I wanted to talk about the new async await uh, concurrency features that came out. Um, and are going to be a part of iOS 15, Xcode 13. So if you don't know, asynchronous code is just a way for us to, to do things in the background without stopping the rest of our code from running. So a lot of times this is a, a network request. So you fire off a network request and we need to wait for that stuff to come back, for the data to come back, and that's usually not an instant thing to happen. And you don't want your app to just be frozen while you're waiting. So asynchronous code comes in, it says, all right, you can fire that off and then we'll, we'll jump back over to a, another thread or we'll, we'll kind of do whatever magic in the background to let the app keep updating its UI. So that's, that's when you're seeing a, a spinning loading indicator or whatever, that's asynchronous code. To give some background here, this is what the existing way of doing asynchronous code is in Swift. So you have completion blocks. Um, and they use closures. Now, I want to say closures don't necessarily always mean that something is async. Closures can just be a way of providing information through a closure block. It doesn't mean that that method is going to be async. But asynchronous methods always have closures currently. Um, so you can see here, this is just some, you know, some dummy methods that I've created. You get a nullable status, so you have a status that can be null. And this is kind of the standard way of saying, all right, this is going to be uh, an async method. This is the completion handler for that. Um, and then I'm just going to immediately call the completion here. A lot of times there's going to be some, you know, sleep or whatever. There's going to be some pause here before that completion handler gets called. And so whatever's waiting on that value is going to be waiting on that. But for our sake, it's just going to be an instantaneous thing. And then here's an example of that method getting called, get nullable status. Here's that value, which is going to be whatever this is. Um, but in this scope, we don't know if this value is going to be uh, null or not. So we call a completion of that. And that's just kind of an example of what these things look like in the existing format. Now, the new syntax, I'll kind of bring you over here to the Swift documentation. They've got an example of what the existing syntax is here as well, kind of the same thing. You'll see that they're introducing a new async keyword and basically they're just saying that async has to come here before you return parameters to kind of define that this is an async method. Um, so that kind of replaces our big messy completion at escaping all that stuff here. Um, and this return value is actually going to be what you would have put here. Um, so some things moving around, but it, it looks a lot more like just a normal method now and you're just adding the async keyword and it kind of gets rid of this whole completion parameter. And then await is the other keyword that's been introduced here. And await is used anytime you're dealing with an async method. So if you've def defined an async method, you're going to have to say await right before you call that. So that kind of makes the code readable to let us know that this isn't just a normal method, this is actually going to be an async method. And that's like the most precise and, and clear way to do this and I love it. Okay, so that's, that's async await as far as documentation is concerned. I wanna show you what it looks like to convert these old methods over to the new async await syntax. Let's go through an exercise of just converting these old methods over to the new syntax. So I'm going to create another method called get nullable status new. We want it to be async, so we're just gonna put async here. And then it's going to return a nullable bool. And this replaces all of this. And it means the same thing basically to the compiler. And then what I can do here is just write bool.random and that's that's a fit, effectively the exact same functionality that you get from this one. We can go another step over here. And what we can actually do is just say await 
certificate, nullable status, new, and unwrap that Boolean. Um, whereas we were unwrapping it here, we can unwrap, well, not really unwrapping, but providing a, a nil condition. So that's where you see that await keyword come in because this is an async method, we have to use this here. Now, if we want to rewrite load status, one thing you'll notice is that if I just try to call get status new, we're gonna get an error that says it's used in a context that does not support concurrency. So it's saying that because this is not an async method. And to do this, which this is like, this is going to happen eventually, not every method can be an async method, right? So what they have you do is create a task. In the earlier versions of the beta, this was an async block, but they just replaced that with task. So now it's task and we can assign our status in here with that await get status new. And so while you still have a closure here and a closure here, you might be thinking like, this doesn't really look like it's like these methods, they're a little bit nicer, right? But they don't really save me a whole bunch. It's kind of the same amount of code, right? And I will show you um, some reasons why this, this is much better. So let's say you're doing a bunch of nested calls, which usually ends up happening if you have maybe network requests that depend on network requests. Um, and you can organize that code to make it look better. But at the end of the day, you have closures inside of closures and that can be kind of hard to read and hard to manage at times. So look at this uh, example and I'll show you, I've already rewritten it. And you can see that we have these three async methods um, to kind of get each of those done in one swoop, you have this really big tree of calls and then you hit the submit car info method here. Well, the same thing with async await. Here's that new syntax for each of these methods. Very pretty here, obviously. This is much less wordy, but really the nice part is that it just looks like regular code here, inline code. You're not having to write blocks for each one of those and call them within each other. Because what's happening here is, since this is an async method, we hit await, it's not going to get to this line until make gets its value, okay? So it's doing the same thing, but it's just much more readable and easier to manage. So that's one benefit of it. What if we did something like guard let val equal val else return. Maybe we unwrap it a different way here. And that way we could just say completion of val. That's gonna compile and that's like, that's fine. But there's a good chance that this uh, method's just gonna be hanging there somewhere, wherever it's called, if we have this guard condition because we're not actually calling completion and there's nothing to enforce that. There's nothing to make sure that we're actually getting that completion block called every time this method is called on. That's another bonus of this because there's no way to, there's no way to make that same mistake with async await. And I like that a lot. Lastly, one thing that obviously comes to mind when we're talking about asynchronous code is network requests, like I mentioned earlier. Here's an example of just a plain old vanilla URL request. Um, all of this is existing code. None of this is new stuff yet. So you create a task. If, if you haven't done this before, this is what it looks like. Um, you, you know, kind of boilerplate code here. We needed to create a URL session. We need to create a URL and then a request based on that URL. The session creates a data task with the request. And within that, when you're creating that, it creates a kind of a response block of what, what are you gonna do when that data comes back? And that's what this is. You get a data response and an error object. And a lot of times you say, is if the error is there, then something went wrong, we'll just handle the error. Otherwise, it was probably good, so we'll handle the data and the response. Or at least that's how I do it. So this is an example of that. And then to actually make that happen, you have to call task.resume. Um, well, along with this new Swift language edition, Apple has updated a lot of their APIs to make it available. So that's just kind of another reason to get familiar with it because it's gonna be introduced to new APIs as Apple releases stuff. And I assume at some point they're gonna stop supporting completion handlers and the old way of doing things. And this is gonna be the way that you kind of have to do it. Obviously this is iOS 15 and up only, so that won't be for a while. 
but um, it's just nice to kind of figure out what's coming ahead. So here's the new request that would replace that old request and you'll see that there's a task block and you'll notice there's a do catch here. The reason for that is instead of the error being returned with the data and response, you'll see that this new session.data call, um, it gives you data and response, but no error because it throws. If the method decides to throw an error, we're actually gonna get that in the catch block instead of with the data and response. I mean, I think that's kind of cool too because that's just one less thing that we have to handle. Um, we can kind of use this to take care of it and kind of organizes those two outcomes a little bit more nicely. But here is what that looks like. Like I said, at this in this simple scenario, it's it kind of looks like the same. It's about the same amount of code and about the same amount of kind of, kind of tiering of, of uh, closures. But as things get more complicated, async await does seem to be more organized and easier to handle, um, which is always good and always what we want. So I hope this was a good introduction to async await. There's a lot that can happen with it, um, a lot more that you can do with it than I've shown here. Um, there's actors and, and all these other things with task that you can do. But I kind of like to look at these things kind of one step at a time and get really, get really comfortable and familiar with this first iteration of using async await. And that's what I wanted this video to be about. So like I said, this is an iOS 15 thing only at this point anyway. Um, I don't know if that's going to change or not, but it sounds like uh, async await is only going to be available if you support iOS 15 and later or if you use, you know, an if available block in your code to kind of use it that way, but I wouldn't really recommend that. Regardless, uh, if you're creating a new app, support iOS 15 and up, and, uh, and you can use this in the fall when that releases, and uh, kind of just be ahead of the game. So I hope this was helpful. Of course, if there are any questions or discussion to be had in the comments, I uh, would love to see that. Would also love to see how you're using async await in your own projects. Um, other than that, thanks for watching. Hope this was super helpful and I will see you all in the next one.